I appreciate your pastor. I, I work with pastors all over the nation, and so many times I spend times with pastors, and one of my uh, time off in December is I really prayed about who I was going to work with in 2020 because so many guys uh, will pay you to come in and sit with them and talk with them and identify areas where their church is stuck or where they're stuck, uh, but they won't make changes. And you can't help somebody that won't make a change. And, and, and you know, I thought, you know, I can either do this for money or I can do this for ministry. And we all need money. We understand that. But at some point, if, if this church is not going to make progress, I want to go work with a church that's making progress. And, and I can tell you, just working with your pastor and, and stuff uh, has just been a joy because I see him making changes and processing things. And this morning, he and I were discussing, I said, I'm a consultant. I'm not the lead pastor. I, I can help you see things you haven't been exposed to, but only you can be led by the Spirit as you lead this church. And uh, great churches across America and across the world have one thing in common. They're pastor-led. Uh, I've been around, uh, I think I told you all last time I was here, in the last three years I've been to Kuala Lumpur twice, did the general counsel for them and another uh, pastors. Uh, they had me come over and speak to all the AG pastors the other year and do 800 uh, pastors in pastor development. I've been to Singapore, I've been to Sri Lanka, spoke for the general counsel there in Sri Lanka, uh, Thailand, India, spoke for the general counsel in India, uh, Kenya, South Africa three or four times, uh, Panama twice, uh, Barranquilla, Colombia, uh, Santa Marta, Colombia, uh, New Zealand, uh, Australia. Uh, I went around the world, and I can tell you that I've looked at the growing churches in the world, and they all have one thing in common. Depending on their culture, there may be, some churches don't have a board. In some churches, uh, especially in Africa, they don't have boards. Uh, they just have the pastor that started the church, and, and, and it's, different, it's a different system. But they're pastor-led, staff-driven, board-empowered, not board-controlled, and congregationally informed. They're not congregationally voted on. And that challenges us as Americans that we don't have a say, but we're no longer in a democracy when we walk through the doors of this church. We're in a theocracy, and when God wants to lead the church, he speaks to the pastor. So I tell people all the time, I say, what's the most important decision I make about church? And the question is, who is your pastor? People say, I just don't know what church to go to. Stop thinking like that. Who is your pastor? Well, I don't like the church. I didn't ask you that. Who is your pastor? Well, you know, uh, you know they, uh, the people aren't friendly. Who's your pastor? You need that person that God has assigned to watch over your soul to lead you where you want to go. And if you choose the wrong pastor, you're going to end up in a mess. You can be in the friendliest church in America, and with the wrong pastor, you're going to end up in a ditch. And so I am grateful to God for your pastor and his passion for you and his love for you and sensitivity and his desire to personally grow. I don't, I don't meet a lot of guys like that. So uh, I was back at my church for a month, and, and it was weird because I hadn't been there all year after I left it. And uh, I had an experience I hadn't had. My son said, Dad, would you take the offering? And uh, I said, sure. And so I got up there, and I looked out across the congregation, and, you know, there's probably, I don't know, maybe 3,000 people in that service. And I said, uh, how many of you don't know who I am? And about 10 to 15% raised their hand. And I thought, I've been gone a year. And how quickly have I been forgotten? What I wanted to say is, well, let me explain to you who I am. Nothing you see was here before I got here. And nothing has been built since I left. I am the almighty of the construction of this church. Before me, there was nothing. And after me, there's been nothing. I, and, and I just thought, you know what? That's the flesh, isn't it? I want to be recognized for my achievement. But you know what? It's not the spirit. Don't get touched the glory. And God spoke to me. He said, that's what your dream was, that the church would continue to grow beyond you. And if everybody knows you, there's been no growth. I, I'm, I told Pastor, I'm working with a church in Florida in a couple of weeks. And uh, the pastor said, can you come in and help me? And I said, well, I don't, I don't know. I can come in and try. I mean, is, you know, we, we say we can do things we don't know. Only God knows things. And it depends on, you know, is there a love connection between my ministry and the church? And I said, what's your biggest problem? He said, well, I want to grow the church. And I, he said, yeah. And he said, my board doesn't. 
He said, my main vocal person on my board says he doesn't want the church to get any bigger because he's comfortable. And I said, let me help you. I will either help you or hurt you. This will go one way or the other. He said, what would you do if you were me? I said, I'd either tell them we're going to grow the church or I'm going to tell the congregation you don't want to grow the church. You're going to let people go to hell, and I want another board. He said, that would divide the church. I said, I'd rather divide it than let it rot. And he said, well, would you come in and do that? I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's not going to be a good experience. I have zero tolerance for people that don't want the church to grow. God adds to the church daily those that are saved. And, well, I don't know everybody. Is that really the will of God that you know everybody? No, it's not. That's, you know, you're not Mrs. Kravitz. And, uh, you know, it's not your job to know what goes on in the neighborhood and look out the window and where, where I mean, stop it. Uh, it, you know, you ought to love everybody, but here's, the, here's what most people don't realize, and I want you all to think through this. How many people in this room have you been out to dinner with or lunch with in the last 30 days? And it's going to be about 10 with gust up to 30 if you went to an event. You take yourself out to lunch, yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's good, yeah. Oh, I don't even know what to say on that one. So, the, uh, so the, the point is, you only do life with a small group of people. We do life in discipleship groups. Jesus did life with 12. But we evangelize crowds. And so the church is made up of a crowd that when they get saved becomes a congregation. But then it's got to go from house to house. And you, you, a big church is always small if you're in relationship with a house group, small group, life group, Sunday school class. That's where you get relationship with. So I want to challenge you as we go through some things. you got to think beyond what you think. I told pastor I want him to preach a sermon series. And I want you to put up a sign, maybe not where the TV is, but somewhere, parking sign. Have you ever driven up and you pulled up in the thing and it says no parking here? you got to have that in your mind. This is not where you belong. This is where you are. It's not where you're going. No parking here. No parking here where there's empty chairs. No parking here in a neighborhood when you could be out on the freeway. No parking here where you gave $5,000 to mission. You could give $10,000. No parking here. Whatever the area is, we're not stopping. We are on a journey to run a race until such a way that we receive the prize. I'm going to talk to you about something today, and I want you to apply it to your church but first of all, I want you to apply it to yourself personally. Because where there is no personal growth, there is no congregational growth. Because the church grows when we make disciples. So if you were to go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 48, verse number 14. What's happening is Israel has conquered the promised land. And after Israel has conquered the promised land, the man of God is dispensing to the tribes of Israel their part. This is your portion, Benjamin. This is your portion, Joe. I mean, he's, he's sharing all the tribes. And he gets to the tribe, the, the priesthood, and the tribe of Levi, the holy priest of God, the Levites. He says, and they shall not sell it or exchange it, any of it. They may not alienate this best part of the land, for it is holy to the Lord. Now, I want you to notice this. They may not alienate the best part of the land. The best part of the land was given to the priest. Let me give you a thought. You and I are a kingdom, a priest unto God. We are the sons and the daughters of God through faith in Jesus Christ. If God gave the best to the priest in the Old Testament, how much more will the new covenant and the blood of Christ give God, have God give us his best? So if God gave us his best, why don't we have his best? Why do we not enjoy the fullness of the blessings of God in our life? And I have a personal supposition. It's not a biblical revelation. It's not something the Spirit of God showed me. But it's life experience as a pastor. My church, over a period of 10 years, built 2,000 churches uh, 200 churches a year in Kenya. 
And so I was in Kenya maybe six to ten times a year, flying back and forth, back and forth, overseeing things and recruiting pastors to donate money. I'd raise $10 million. So we're doing a significant work to get the Kenya Assemblies of God down the road, and I'm working with the Kenyan missionaries to help them understand there needs to be an end date on every missionary. At what point have we done our job in this nation and the local church can go on and we don't have to keep sending you over here? We send you somewhere where we hadn't been yet which is a foreign concept to the AG missionaries. I was on the World Missions Board, and I felt like a, a third wheel. So, uh, you know, but at what point are we done? And so uh, we're over there doing that, and I got to watching because I was uh, in a lot of places. And I got to go on a lot of safaris, and, uh, you know, we'd be building churches out there, camped out, we'd have to hire Maasai to guard us at night because we're in pup tents, and, they're, you know, keep the elephants out and, and – you know, the lines are not as aggressive towards people, but, you know, if they got in there, it'd be a bad deal. So, uh, you know, but I got to know that everything down on the Mara, the Serengeti, the difference in the Masai Mara and the Serengeti, the Serengeti is the same valley in Tanzania as the Masai Mara is in Kenya. Don't, it's just separated by rivers, it's the same valley. But one nation calls it the Serengeti, the other one calls it the Masai Mara. So we're down there on the Mara, and I'm looking. Nothing has peace on the Mara. Nothing. I mean, things are chasing each other. They're they're fighting with each other. They're running for their life. They're, you know, if I don't catch something, I'm going to starve. If I get caught, I'm going to die. I mean, and and it, it's it, it is a brutal, brutal life. I mean, the 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 trauma things that you see is when one of these predators catches something, they don't wait till it's dead to start eating it. I mean, it's brutal. But you go over towards Mount Kenya. And you get into the hill country up near Neri, which it doesn't mean anything to you. What, up near Neri, and the lions aren't up there. And the cheetah aren't up there. There may be a leopard. But by and large, it gets calmer. The higher you get, the calmer it is. Pastor Washira Karani, who we built the church for, He's running about 4,000 now, and he started 27 churches since we built his church. It's an amazing testimony of a man of God. Was the National Security Director for Communications for the Kenyan Army at one point in his life. And his personal job was every two weeks, he had to climb Mount Kenya. Now, you can drive most of the way up it, but then the last maybe, I don't know, what, whatever it is, is a straight-up hike and climb. And on top of Mount Kenya, there is a security tower. And if all the communication networks in Kenya go down, the military communicate with the president. This one tower covers the nation, and they secure that tower. That tower is critical to military communication. Every two weeks he climbs up there. He checks, are the batteries charged? Uh, because if the power goes down, they're going to have to run it off these batteries. Uh, are the cables straight? Anything going on? So he convinces me to go up there with him. He said, I want to show you what I used to do. Now, I'm probably 50, 52 at this time, and I'm in pretty good shape. I think, come on, man, because he's a little fat boy. I mean, I'm thinking if Waddle Bottom can get up there, I can go. And so uh, we start, and we're going up this mountain, and he's got these little legs. He looks like SpongeBob. He's just square. I mean, he's a little square guy with a little leg. He's just going up this mountain. I'm going up this mountain. And I realize, oh, Lord Jesus. I can't breathe. And you know how when you're going uphill, everything on the backside of your legs is hurting. And all of a sudden, I'm having to, I'm, I'm holding on to these rocks as we go by. I'm kind of pulling myself. And he's just going. You know, and he's just talking about what, you know, I'm thinking, shut up. Just breathe. I mean, I don't want to talk to you. I can't breathe. We finally get up there, and I, I, it's horrible because it's, there, it's, it's ice and stuff up there. there. You're on the equator. This mountain is high enough to have snow on it. And, you know, I put on a windbreaker. You know, you need a, a parka. I mean, this thing is cool. And I'm up there, and he's going, you know, I do this. I'm thinking, okay, I've seen the, th the tower. That was impressive. Let's get off this mountain. I, I believe I'd go downhill better than uphill. And so I'm on the way over by the tray. He said, come here. I want to show you something. I said, oh, God. So I go over there, and he says, look over there. What do you see? I said, man, I see the valley. I can see, you know, Neri down there. I mean, you can see for forever from up there. He said, no, what do you see? And I said, uh, crops, pineapple fields. He said, no, look over the edge. And I said, well, it's some kind of a nest. He said, it's an eagle's nest. 
The only thing that rests on top of this mountain is an eagle. You know why? He said, he said no. He said, it has no predators. It has no irritants. It has no challenge. That eagle is the only animal in this nation when it rises up that has perfect peace. And it dawned on me when Christians get saved, they get out of the valley of stress and despair, and when they get to the hills of God's goodness, they think this is good enough, and they sit down. They don't run the race. They don't pay the price to get to the top of the mountain. They don't go all the way. And so today I want to talk to you about how to get to the top of the mountain. Last time I was here, I shared my testimony of how I spent eight and a half years of my life in prison. I started at the bottom. I started messed up with no hope whatsoever. And this encounter with Jesus Christ has created a passion in my life to run the race in such a way that when people look at me, they say, he, you can't get to where he is from where he was except by the grace of God. I want my life to be a testimony of God's amazing grace. The Bible is a book of principles and precepts. And, you know, the Bible says you shall know that I was in, let me back up. I was in a church the other day, and the pastor said, we just preach grace in this church. I said, that's why none of your people are disciples. I don't want to underestimate grace. But Jesus came filled with grace and truth. Grace gets you in the kingdom. Truth sets you free. People that don't know truth, don't, they live in bondage. Lazarus had grace. He was alive. But somebody had to unwrap him. The Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Can I tell you, the truth you don't know, don't do you no good. Pastor, talk to you about giving today and don't eating, don't eating your seed. Most people don't understand the difference in praise and worship because they don't study the word. Praise is what the wise men did. We just came out of Christmas when they saw the star. The Bible says they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. But when they got to Jesus... The Bible says they worshiped him with gold, incense, and myrrh. God is looking for people that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Worship requires a gift. Praise requires a voice. People say, I'm a worshiper. Well, show me what you gave, and I'll tell you if you're telling the truth or not. And people don't like to talk about that because they don't like to talk about money in church. Jesus talked more about money than he did faith, hope, and love, all three. You know why? You spend more of your life trying to make money than anything else. And he was telling you how to maximize the effort you're giving with your life by letting God put a blessing on it. So I'm going to get into some principles today that will help you to get to a place called best. Number one, and you're going to, we're, we're going to reiterate these until they're down in your spirit a little bit, you got to believe it. You have to believe that God has a best place for you. You can't say, well, that's just idealistic thinking. You're just looking at life through rose-colored glasses. John Conley, who sang rose-colored glasses in the Grand Ole Opry, goes to my church. We had him sing it 4th of July, uh, July a year or so ago in one of our productions, and he came out and sang rose-colored glasses. And you know what? It, it, faith is not rose-colored glasses. Faith is a product of a blood-covered life. And, and you know... When Abraham was told to leave Ur of the Chaldees, people thought he was crazy. You're living in a good place. <clears throat> you got a lot of money. You're wealthy. You've got servants. You're in the top. You're a one percenter. But he said, there has to be more to life than this. There's something in me that says there's more to life than this. I believe there is a better place. Abraham left Ur, and he's on his way to the promised land, which he doesn't know where it is, and he gets to Haran, H-A-R-A-N. It, it was a location that was halfway, didn't know it at the time, halfway between Ur of Chaldees and where he was going to the promised land. His father-in-law had lost a son named Haran, Sarah's father. When he got to Haran, the father-in-law said, I can't go any farther. He said, Abraham, how much farther is it? I don't know. How will we know when we get there? I don't know. But God is saying to follow him, he's taking us to the promised land. And the father-in-law could not get past halfway. Part of the problem is he didn't have the emotional help to get over what he had, been done, had done to him. And because he didn't get victory over the damage that hurt and loss had done to him, he couldn't pursue the dream that God had in front of him. He wanted to live in his memories, not his dreams. And when your memories are greater than your dreams, you're done. 
You've got to keep your dreams alive in front of you. And Abraham had to make a decision, am I willing to leave family to go where God wants me to go? A lot of people get trapped on the journey because you won't leave somebody behind that's holding you back. And that's a challenge. And it's a challenge for every person. See, do you really believe that God has something better? Because if you don't really, 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 really believe it, you won't pay the price to go get it. Do you believe that God wants you to be healthy? Do you eat like that? Do you exercise? Do you sleep? Do you do the things that we know? You know, the Bible says, this is horrible because I, I, you know, I struggle with eating. I, I struggle with eating. And uh, you put those, those snacks in my room last night. You're an evil pastor. <laughs> there was this popped corn covered in caramel. Now, the good news is five servings are only 600 calories. Yeah. But there are 102 carbs. About 45 carbs a meal is what you're supposed to stay at. So I didn't have breakfast, so I evened that out for the Lord. But you know you're not supposed to eat that. We pray, oh, God, bless this fried chicken and these French fries and these biscuits and gravy. And God says, choke on it. Don't ask me to bless what you, you know, to, to, if you know it's wrong, it's a sin. Some people say, I just don't sin. If you ate a piece of fried chicken, you sin because you ain't supposed to eat grease. But you're obviously not from the South either. So, do you really believe God wants you to have a good marriage? Do you really believe God wants you to have fun in your marriage and passion in your marriage and cherishing in your marriage and love in your marriage and joy in your marriage and you do life together and you end up at the end of the journey sitting on the porch and looking at that person saying, I'm glad I did life with you. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that God wants to bless you financially? Do you really believe that God wants to bless you on your job? Do you really believe that God wants to bless you in your spiritual growth? Do you really believe it? Because if you don't really believe it, you're never going to see it. What do you believe about your future? What do you believe about your life? What do you believe about your marriage? What do you believe about your career? What do you believe about your intellect? People say, well, I was told that I have an IQ of this. They have proven now you can change your IQ through exercising your brain and study. There is no more fixed mindset. We have a growth mindset. You say, well, I'm a creative. I can't do administration. Well, you obviously don't believe the Word of God. Because the Bible says you can do all things through Christ. So if you're a natural creative, you can develop the administrative. And if you're naturally administrative, you can develop the creative. If you're naturally happy, you can learn how to be tender. If you're naturally, uh, what do they call those gregarious p- people, those people that are uh, overly extroverted and they're just, they, you know, they're just loud and happy and going and won't ever shut up. You, you know, you can learn to be still and find the presence of God. Shut up. I mean, you, you, there's just so many things that we don't think we can do that God said, yes, you can. I am a high, high introvert. When pastor lets me go to the hotel, I do the happy dance. I am by myself. It's where I recharge. But I have learned to communicate. I was called to do it. God calls people sometimes beyond their own ability. Can you imagine Abraham believed it? Nobody believed it. But when he got to that land and he put his foot in the promised land and he realized this is where God called me to, can you imagine the value, the sense of achievement, the sense of reward, the sense of destiny for the family and the heritage and his namesake? We are sons and daughters of Abraham. Why? Because Abraham left Ur and went all the way to the Canaan land, to the promised land, and did what God told him to do. Number one, you got to believe it. So let's say it together. I, I, I. Number two, you got to see it. Abraham was a traveling tent dweller. What God said is, Abraham, come up here, and every place you see, I will give to you. You can believe you've got a, a great marriage coming. You can believe you got a great, but can you see it? 
Can you see yourself in shape? Can you see yourself out of debt? Can you see yourself in love? If you can't see it in your spirit man, in your mind's eye, you're never going to receive it. And most the time the reason we have small achievements is we try to see what God is able to do from the pit of the problem the pit of despair the pity party and we get down in the pit instead of coming up and getting as high as we can to see as far as we can we try from a low place in our life from a broken place in our life to see a vision or a dream that God has and it won't work you don't see very much there because it just produces despair the picture you see will print your faith. Your faith will never be greater than what you see. You can say, I have great faith. Tell me what you see. Well, I just don't know. Well, faith is the substance of things hoped for. So if you can't see anything, you can't hope for anything. God asks people over and over, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? Pastor, when you and I are talking about the future of the church, what do you see? We spent a whole, about 45 minutes yesterday. What do you see? Well, I want to do this. What do you need to do before you do that? Well, you needed to see 800 people. Because until you get to the 800 people, you can't do all the other things that you got in your heart to do. What happens, we start doing what we think we ought to do before we achieve what we need to achieve. So you got to see, and you got to see clearly what God is doing. Just so you know, just because you see it doesn't mean other people are going to see it. I got saved. I'm in prison. God calls me to preach. I do Brian School of the Bible. I just called the, the other day, and I was getting some transcripts. And the lady I was talking to, she said, you're Maury Davis? I said, yeah. She said, your picture is the last picture before we walk into our office. You're, you're the champion in the Hall of Fame. I said, yeah, well, good. Send me some money. I said, I need my transcripts. <laughs> yeah, all right. it's like. But I knew God called me to preach, so I went and started getting my education and preparing myself. Well, my dad, who was a crane operator and then owned a crane company, and they got saved, but he's looking at this boy in prison. He don't understand ministry at all. He understands work. He says, son, I know you're called to preach, but why don't you get maybe a, a, one of those vocational courses like in air conditioning repair? There are always going to be air conditioning, sir. You know, small engine repair, fixing motors. I said, dad, I'm called to preach. He said, well, in case that doesn't work out. When you're called to do something, there is no in case that doesn't work out. You got to go for it. You got to you got to trust God. You got to go do it. And and you know there are people that won't say that, you know they don't see it. My pastor, when I was the custodian at the church, he said, "Hey, Mari, now that you're the head of custodians, let's get you some uh, facilities training over here." I said, "Pastor, I'm not called to do this for a long time. I'm called to preach." My own pastor did not really believe what God was going to do in my life. And yet I had a video of him sharing that testimony in my church one time about he didn't see what God saw. And my life awakened him, don't ever limit what God's called somebody to do. You don't know what God is going to do with somebody else's life. And uh, you got to understand that just because other people don't see your vision doesn't mean you don't need to see it. I went through some persecution in prison. Those guards, you know, and guards don't like inmates because inmates do things to the guards. Yeah. Well, normally a guard comes in with a pretty good attitude, and then the inmates do stuff to them, and then they decide they hate guards. <laughs> inmates say, why do they treat us like this? It's called reaping and sowing. <laughs> when you spit on them and throw urine on them and slap at them or say crazy things to them, they're going to do something to you. And the guards always win. Always. And uh, <laughs> these this guards come out and say, preacher, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting ready. I said, for when I get out. You're not ever going to get out. I said, oh, I'm going to get out. And if you do get out, nobody's going to listen to you preach. I said, yeah. I had to overcome people saying things to me that were an attack on what God called me to be. But I could see myself doing the things that I now have accomplished in life. One of the great joys of my life uh, last year was sitting down with my children. Actually, it was uh, October of 18. Now, the year's gone by. And it was a letter I wrote my mother, May the 18th, 1975, the night I was sent to prison. And it said, Mom, this is what God spoke to me to do. And last year I gave all of my children, 18, I gave all my children a copy of the letter, and I wrote in red letters, done, every dream I gave my mother 44 years ago. Done. That, that's where I want to see people end up 
saying done, not, well, I died with undone dreams. I died with unfulfilled desires. I got it done. And, and you know, when, when you're done, now what are you going to do? Because there's some other, if you got that done, there's still more to do if you're still here. Yeah, somebody said, well, what are you going to do now? Quit? I said, no, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to see what God wants me to do now. Yeah. You got to see it. You got to see it. You're young. What do you see? Other than boys. What do you see? I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, number one, you've got to. Come on, say it. Number one, you've got to. No, number one, you've got to believe it. Number one. Number two. Number one. Number two. Number one. Number two. Number three, uh-uh, claim it. you you got to claim it. We have been so freaked out by the faith crowd that we have moved out of the Word of God in the power of life and death or in the power of the tongue. David grew up in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is outside of Jerusalem. Bethlehem was a good place to live, but Jerusalem was the city on a hill. And if you remember when David killed Goliath, you've heard preachers saying David swung his head around. That's not what he did. The Bible says he took the head at 15 years of age over of Goliath and he impaled it outside the gates of Jerusalem and he told the guards at the gates, I'm going to live in that city someday. No king of Israel had ever taken Jerusalem. No king of Israel had ever achieved it. No king of Israel had ever done it. But a 15-year-old boy that had a dream and a destiny and a calling on his life, a prophetic word from a man of God, said, I'm going to live in that city. He claimed it. So many times we're afraid to claim it because of what people are going to say when we say it that we withdraw and we kill our own dream because we won't say it. When I went to Nashville, Tennessee in 1991 and became the pastor of a church that was being repossessed and had enough money to save it, but I had to work nights at the truck company. I unloaded trucks my first year two nights a week. Uh, People don't understand what I did to make a living uh, so the church could get by until we could get the church growing. And two nights a week, I didn't sleep. I went to work every morning at 7 a.m. And I never wrote a sermon my first five years before 10 p.m. at night or after 6 a.m. in the morning. I, I didn't take a vacation for five years. I took three days off my first year. And I don't recommend that's not biblical, but I know how, how to do anything better. So I just, we just ground on the church to grow this thing. We, we gave everything we had for church growth. And church growth means people getting saved, people getting set free. I mean, churches don't grow with crowds. They grow with lives that are being transformed. And, uh, you know, somebody said, well, you know, we just had a bunch of visitors. Well, if you don't put meat in the seat, God can't put a soul in the altar. So your job is not to get people saved. Your job is to get them into a place where salvations are happening. And so who's the visitor you brought with you? That'd be the question. So we're, we're working, and so I begin to tell the church, we're going to build the largest Assembly of God church in the state of Tennessee. We're going to build the largest Assembly of God church in the history of the state of Tennessee. We're going to set the example for churches in the Assemblies of God. And, and it wasn't long that uh, my presbyter, who was an older guy, and he was really stuck in a rut, and he and another pastor called me before the sectional committee for making uh, statements they didn't like. I don't know what the charge was. And they said, why would you say that? I said, I believe that's what God called me to do. They said, well, don't you think the rest of us are are part of that? I said, not apparently. Now, I'm I'm young. I have no idea about the politics of the Assemblies of God. And, you know, I mean, yeah. And uh, one of them said, uh, well, don't you think our churches are doing that? I said, you've been here 27 years, about 30 years at that point. And he said, yes, sir. I said, you have 100 people in one of the largest cities in this state. You got 100 people after 30 years. I said, I could draw a crowd like that. And I said something I shouldn't have said. Just so you know, I know this is wrong, but tell you the truth. I said, I could stand in the Walmart parking lot and zip my zipper up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, and draw a crowd of 100 people. I said, you've got the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, you know, I had to go to the district council then. I mean, they sent it all up. But so, but my passion for the lost will not tolerate people that are lukewarm. There's something in me that cannot stand that traditional spirit. And I love our fellowship. I love our doctrine. I love the moving of the spirit. But if the same 40 people are running around the church every Sunday night talking about a move of God and nobody's getting saved, that's not a move of God. That's a move of the flesh. 
Now, I'm not talking about if you live in Possum Trot, Tennessee, and there's only 60 people in town and 40 of them are in your church. That's a mega church. But in Nashville, Tennessee, to not have a growing church when the community is growing, we didn't have a church in the entire town that had 400 people in it. But you know what? If I don't say it, I never see it. Because if you see it and you don't say it, what you saw will die. And if you're not running the race and climbing the mountain, it gets farther and farther away as time goes by. You've got to claim it. Standing backstage one day, we used to have one of those big churches. I worked at a mega church, and I was the youth pastor. And uh, Actually, I wasn't the youth pastor yet. I was the uh, administrative assistant to the senior pastor. I moved from being the custodian, the head of custodians, to his assistant during the construction program. And we had these curtains, and the curtains are going up, and the timpani's rolling. I mean, it had a full orchestra. And he looked at me, and he says, Davis, are you dating anybody? I said, no, sir. He said, why not? I said, you don't give me any time off. He said, well, okay, well, you know, the curtains are open. We're just standing there because I've got to go through a song in about three or four minutes. And he said, look out across there. Which one of these girls would you date? And I said, Pastor, give me a break. None of these church girls are going to date me. I just got out of prison a year and a half ago. I spent eight and a half years of my life in the pokey. He said, well, where are you going to find a wife? I said, I don't know. Go down to the red light district and get somebody saved. And He said, you are not going to work on this staff and go down to the red light district. I mean, and he said, I said, well, I don't know who to date. He said, how about that girl playing the piano? I said, Gail? He said, yeah. I said, well, I don't know her that well, but she's engaged. He said, so? And walked off. I went out, and I thought, well, my pastor said do it, and I'm a man under authority. She was, she was dating a mortgage banker named Phil. And so I take Phil out to work out, and I'm in pretty good shape back then after being in prison. You know, you get strong in there because you got to be. And... Uh, we work out, and I know he's rubbery. His legs are rubbery. His arms are rubbery. He's just a little mushy banker. And so I'm sitting in the whirlpool with him. I said, Phil, I never want to do anything in darkness. Anything you do in secret is never of God. If you have to take it in secret, it's not God. If you have to do it in darkness, it's not God. So I need to tell you something. He said, what? He was getting out and grabbing a towel. I said, I'm going to marry Gail. He said, okay. He said, what? I said, I'm going to marry Gail. He said, yeah, whatever. And he just walked off. I thought, well, I told you. A week or so later, I get a call from Brother Brazier, who pastored the Tabernacle Assembly of God. He said, Maury, we're going to start a church in Middle Othian, Texas, in a tent. Would you come down and give your testimony as an old sawdust revival and get some people saved? And we're going to start the church. We're going to do five nights. I want you to lead off. I said, okay. He came back in about 30 minutes and said, do you know anybody who plays the piano and sings? I said, yeah, I know a girl in our church does that. Her name is Gail. So I called Gail Daniels. I said, Gail, I got, she said, I'd love to do that. Her, her grandfather pioneered AG churches in Arkansas. She's, a, she's AG Bible quiz, AG teen talent before it was fine arts. She's AG, AG. I mean, AG, AG. <laughs> Bless her heart. So I said, hey, tell Phil that he can go with us. Brother Brazier's going to pick us up at the church because we couldn't go out of town, me and another single woman by ourselves, and we would do things appropriate. So we show up at the church, and Phil ain't there. I said, where's Phil? She said, well, you know, his mother's out of town. He had to walk, his, walk her dog. And I thought, he's a 28-year-old mortgage banker still living with his mother. Tells you all you need to know about Mama's boy. And so we go do this revival. We get back to the church. It's about 9 o'clock, 9.30 that night. And I look at her. I said, did you get anything to eat? She said, no, I'm starving. I said, could I buy you a quick meal? She said, yeah. Well, I get her in my car. So I take her to a Greek restaurant just on the edge of Dallas. And it's Costas is the name of the restaurant. And, I mean, they've got the candlelight. They've got the little band playing. They've got stuff going on. And I've got the Chateaubriand for two with the candlelight between us. We're just talking. My minor in prison was in psychology. And, and so I studied hormone is what I really majored in, different hormones and chemical release. And so, so I'm talking to Gail. And I know that if I lower the timber of my voice and speak in a lower tone with a little bit of rasp to it, it adds authority and charisma to the conversation. Yeah. I also know if I can get her to look me in an eye, in the eye, for between 60 and 120 seconds, pheromones are going to start being released in her brain, 
And it's a bonding pheromone when a woman just looks a man in the eye. You know, you guys think she just wants me to touch her. No, she wants to look you in the eye. So I'm telling Gail these funny prison stories. And she's just laughing. We're eating and stuff. And I start telling her one that's, that's going to go really deep sad. And as I'm telling her this story sad, she's, and I, I realize, okay, she's looking. I just not only lower the timbre of my voice, I lower the volume. So now she has to lean in to hear. And by the end of the story, we're about six inches apart across this candle when I tell her what God did. And just about the last 20 seconds, I just touched her on the hand. Another pheromone release. Touched her on the hand. Ended up just taking her by the hand and holding her hand as I told her this sad story. When I was done, she was just sitting there. We're just sitting there, just looking. And she realized, she goes, uh, I feel like I'm cheating on Phil. And because she's, you know, one of these extremely conscious people. And I said, I told Phil I was going to marry you. She said, what? <laughs> uh-huh. That was in September. We got married the next May. But you know what I, I did? I claimed it. See, the Bible says a man that finds a good wife. Now, this is not going to be politically correct in this hypersensitive society. That word find means hunts. Men are made, and I'm going to use this not in the sexual term, but in the pursuit term, you're the predator, she's the prey. Can you catch her? You know why women get in a car with a man and they're going... You know, you drive all over the world without your wife and don't hit anybody. But when she's in there, you're going to hit everybody. Did you see that? Did you see that? You know why? Women have a greater peripheral vision than men. Men have a more predatory vision like this. And then I'll say, it's why, like you send your husband to the refrigerator, go get the mustard. And they, men look at a refrigerator like this. And you say, it's on the third shelf in the middle. A woman walks in there and says, I told you, it was right here. I mean, you know why? We don't see the way you see. <laughs> you got to learn to claim it. You got to claim your promise. I am going to get out of this prison. I am going to preach the gospel. I am going to build a church. I am going to marry a good wife. I am going to have great children. I am going to have a future. I am going to be blessed going in and coming out. I'm blessed to be the head and not the tail. I'm blessed to be in the house of God. I'm blessed. You've got to learn to claim it with your mouth. Number one, you've got to believe it. I. Number two, you've got to. Number three, you've got to. Say it again. I. 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 And number four, you've got to take it. You've got to take it. It is. Because it requires the right anointing at the right time. You know, in the flatlands, you require the spirit of salvation. In the hills, you require a second anointing. But to get to the mountain, you require a third anointing. Everything God does in your life will require three moves of the spirit. Everything. Jesus was born of the spirit. He was empowered by the spirit in the wilderness. He was resurrected by the spirit. You're saved by the spirit. You're filled with the spirit. You'll be resurrected by the Spirit. Everything that the Spirit does has a three-part fold. And if you're not walking in the right anointing at the right time, if you get ahead of the anointing, you, you're going to do it in your own strength and you're going to fail. So we have to be a Spirit-led people. That is incredibly critical to what we're doing. David had three anointings. At age 15, he had the prophetic anointing. You're the king of Israel. You know what he was king of? Nothing. Nothing. He was 30 years of age when he got his second anointing, 15 years later. See, the Bible says you have need of endurance that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. You say, I'm waiting on the will of God. What are you doing? Nothing. Well, there, there is no coming without a doing. Uh -huh. Obedience is important. But at 30 years of age, he didn't get the whole thing. He got two tribes. We got to be, you know, I got out of Bible college. I'm ready for a church. No, you might be ready to start figuring out what you ought to have learned in school. Well, I knew Greek and Hebrew. Good. You're speaking to Hispanics and Caucasians and African Americans. And don't none of them speak Greek or Hebrew. 
I know people that can preach to people that aren't in the room. You ever heard a sermon and think, what are you talking about? That's the guy that's more enamored with what he's saying than who he's talking to. Just so you know, my level of communication, it just gets right down to the lowest common denominator. I mean, somebody said, how do you communicate? I said, I look at the room. If you've got a Ph.D. and an M.A. and a bachelor's and a high school graduate, you always speak to the high school graduate. The rest of them will understand what you're saying. But if you talk to the Ph.D., you're leaving somebody out. Jesus included everybody. He was 37 years of age when he got his third. So it was 22 years from his first anointing till he got all 12 tribes and became the king of Israel. He had a prophetic destiny when Samuel created, put the oil on him. He had a measure of rule when he became two tribes over the tribe of Benjamin. Third, he got seven years later when he became an elder. But then he said, I got to take Jerusalem because remember he claimed Jerusalem. So he said to the, the people, you read your Bible, whoever opens the gates of Jerusalem is my man. Whoever opens those gates. What David knew that inside of Jerusalem, because he played out by the pool of Jehan, there was an aqueduct that was 67 feet long, 67 foot tunnel that went under Jerusalem, and it was 38 feet high. He said, whoever goes through that tunnel, climbs that well, and comes out and fights whoever he's got to fight and opens the gate, you go and get to live in Jerusalem with me. His cousin Joab, who lived in Bethlehem with him, had played with David in that tunnel and knew how to do it. His cousin said, I'm not called to be king, but if I help the man that God called to be king become king, I'll get to live in the same blessing the king does in the city of Jerusalem. So Joab went on behalf of his cousin David and went down after his third anointing and occupied Jerusalem. Sometimes what God has called you to do requires people called to you to help you do it. If you're not called to be the king, you're called to be the cousin. In my church, I was called to be the king. Not the king of kings, but the king, the leader. In this church, I'm called to be the cousin. Because there's a leader that God has established. And where I help the leader achieve the dreams that God has given him for this congregation, I position myself to live in the blessings of the same dream he does. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violence taken by force. We have got to stop playing patty cake with the devil. Our enemy is not people. Now you can recognize that they are, we have the sons of God and the sons of Satan. There's only two groups of people on this planet, the saved and the lost. And everybody's not saved is lost and they're under the influence of a demonic spirit. And the only thing that will set them free is to see the light. And they see the light by us loving them living in front of them in such a way they can't live without the God that we serve, our living in power and authority gives them the ability to say, I want what they got. But Christian, well, you know, I'm just a poor, humble Christian. That's not anybody's goal in life. Poverty is my goal. No, it's not. Being poor is bad. You can't pay for the doctor. You can't get gas. You can't pay for your kids. We want to help people be set free. But you've got to claim it. You've got to take it. So number one, we believe it. Number two, we see it. Number three, we claim it. Number four, we take it. Number one. Number two. Number three. Number four. Number one. Number two. Number three. Number four. Number five. You got to buy it. You got to pay for it. David is on his way to accomplishing the ultimate dream in Jerusalem. He's in Jerusalem. And he decides we need to build a house for God in this city. It took David 29 years to rebuild Jerusalem the way he wanted to do it. And now he's ready to build the temple. And he sends his men to the house of Ornan, who has a threshing floor. That's where they're going to build the temple of David, the temple of God. The soldiers get there, or the ambassadors, whoever went to see him, and they said, we want your city, the king wants it. Now, we think he was a spiritual man. He wasn't, he was a frightened man, because if you've never been in the presence of a king, I, I, I met with the king of Swaziland two years ago. 
I had to go through two hours of training on how to enter the presence of a king. And, you know, you, never, you don't stand up unless he's standing up. You never look down at the king. You don't touch him. If he reaches out his hand, you shake it with your right hand. You never touch him with both hands. If he puts a glass of tea between y'all, you set your, You never said anything between you and him. It was an amazing understanding of what it meant to deal with a king. Well, he, the other thing is he has multiple wives. And that king can have your wife. He's the king. Everything in the kingdom belongs to him, including you and your children. So when they told Ornan, I want your threshing floor, he thought, if I say no, he may kill me. He may put me in prison. He said, I'll give it to him. And David made a spiritual statement that most Christians don't get. He said, I can't offer to God something that costs me nothing. We want to offer praise and call it worship, but we don't pay our tithe. We want to say, I'm living for God, but I'm not going to spend my money to send a missionary. I'm living for God, but I'm not going to cook a meal for my neighbor who just had a baby or was hit in a car wreck. We want to offer service to God without manifesting it in our service to people in a tangible way. David said, I can't do that. I have the right to not to take that land. I have the authority to take that land. But I'm going to offer that to God. And I can't offer to God something that doesn't personally cost me anything. People said, how did you work the first year without a paycheck? It's not the, job, it's not the church's job to take care of me. It's my job to take care of the church. See, I've got to seek first the kingdom of God, and then all the other things are added. My wife got a job. We had to put our children in, in daycare. We had never had to do that. We'd been traveling as evangelists, had triplets. Uh, we just had to get down and make it happen. But I told her, if you'll work for a year, I'll put enough people in this church that we can get the paycheck they told us we were going to get last year. And it wasn't a lot, but it was enough that she could stop working. We could both work on growing the church. Some people say, I want a great church, but you won't pay for it. How many times do people not pay their tithes? And I, and I can tell you, we say, well, poor people, poor people pay their tithes more often than rich people. I've got a number of millionaires in my church. To my knowledge, none of them have ever paid tithe on their annual income. Well, I made $20 million. What would the church do with $2 million? I don't know. We built $53 million worth of buildings, maybe pay off some of the debt. You see, your question is wrong. It's not what would the church do with it. It's why do you still have it? You robbed God. Well, I'm the number one giver in the church. Well, you thought you were, but you're not. I know a guy that doesn't make 10% of what you make, but he's faithful. Now, you can't say that to people. You got to buy it. Number one, we believe it. Number two, we see it. Number three, we claim it. Number four, we take it. Number five, we buy it. Number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, last one. Number six, we, we keep it. Remember the scripture? It said don't sell it, don't lose it, don't trade it out. Don't alienate yourself from it. Zedekiah watched Nebuchadnezzar kill all six of his sons before they put his eyes out. All he remembered was tragedy in his mind's eye. Brutal, brutal judgment on this man. How many of us, how many preachers, how many husbands, how many wives, have gotten to an incredible place only to lose it. We had the best place. We had a great church. We had a great family. We had a great company. We had a great marriage. We had great children. We had great community respect. We had great influence. But somehow we didn't realize that that command is for the children of God. The world says sell it. And can I tell you, if you've got a price, the, world, the devil will pay it. When our church got to 1,000, I was 40 years old, and, I, and that was my vision, to build a church of 1,000. I thought if I can get out of prison and build a church of 1,000, that would be a significant miracle. 
for an inmate to have a church of a thousand in this community, in this day and age, that would be a miracle of God's grace. So when I got to a thousand, I, I had no more vision. And I went through a year of emotional struggle. I, I, I didn't know if it was depression. I didn't know if it was oppression. I, I know what it was. I could preach on Sundays, but Monday through Friday, I would catch myself sitting in a room just crying. And Tommy Barnett called me one time, and, he, and I, I talked to my pastor, and he told Tommy, and Tommy called me and said, Hey, Mari, Pastor George told me what you're going through. I said, Yes, sir. He said, he said Let me help you. He said, I'm going to set you free. I said, Great. He said, you had a vision when you were 18 that you could build a church of 1,000. He said, yeah. He said, uh, you, that's kind of like parking the car out in the driveway and turning the lights on and not driving the car and expecting the lights to keep sticking out. He said, if you'll just keep moving, the vision will expand. The dream will expand. He said, because you thought that it was a final vision, you didn't understand that God leads you from glory to glory. He said, you got led to glory and sat down. Get a... And it, the, it was amazing how a simple conversation let me dream again. It was in that time that a man offered me a quarter million dollars a year to speak 50 Friday nights a year for us, a financial planning company, and they would fly me out on Friday night. I would speak for an hour and a half, and they'd fly me back on Saturday morning, private jet. A quarter million dollars a year, 50, and they were going to write the thing. They just wanted me to deliver the speech. Everything in me said, do it. Go for the money. Go for the money. But there was something in me, that my core conviction, that, I, that the Bible is the infallible Word of God and the gifts and the calling of God are without regard. God called me to preach the gospel. He did not call me to be a motivational speaker. It doesn't mean I can never do a motivational speech, but that's not what my career is. I've always wanted to go to Zanies and do comedy, but I was afraid that my church members would freak out. I, I think I'd do great at Zanies because I'd have a lot of fun with those drunk people. Yeah. Yeah. I just tell I just tell things that people came in and counseling and talked to me about. I mean, counseling in a church is like you you, you can't do it, but you look at people and go, "Huh?" I, mean, yeah. I had this guy kept telling me, "I want to kill myself. I'm going to kill myself." And finally, I realized this is not a truly suicidal person. This is a person crying for attention, and I can't give him any more attention. So I bought an electric razor and I said, I, "Let me help you do that. Here's an electric razor. Start on your wrist." He said, that's not funny. I said, it is to me. He didn't come back. I was free. I had an hour a week for the rest of my life that I never had to see the guy again. I mean, at some point, I've told you to go see a psychiatrist. I don't know what to say to you. I've, I've you know, I prayed with you. I poured oil on you. But you want, you, you want to be depressed. You want to be depressed. You leave church and you feel better and you go home and you turn, you pull the curtains in your room and turn out the lights and listen to sad music and wonder why the atmosphere around you doesn't make the demons that are oppressing you go away. You, you create an atmosphere where the enemy's comfortable. If you put on the garment of praise and cast off the garment of heaviness, you're going to get happy. Just stop, doing the, just stop going home and closing the drapes. Matter of fact, don't go home. Go out with some other Christian people. But a good old Norelco electric razor he was set free. You, the, the, but, the, you know, I had to realize the devil wants to pay for me. And if I'm for sale, the devil's going to pay my price. The second thing is, 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 is don't barter it. Don't, don't sell it. Don't let the flesh rob you of the blessing of God. It's what Esau did. For a piece of porridge, for a pot of porridge, a bowl of porridge, he sold his birthright. Man, the flesh... Is the flesh is not your friend. And when we talk about the flesh, let's go beyond the body. Let's talk about our carnal nature. Selfishness is a good word. Selfishness. Self, self-centeredness. You know, the other day I was talking to a pastor. He said, I'm just trying to discover who I am. I said, that's the least of your problems. You need to discover who he is. Nobody called you to, to have self-identification. I need to know who I am. You are who God said you were, so if you meet God, he'll tell you who you are. You don't need to figure out who you are. God already told you who you are. You just need to listen. You're either a man or a woman. You're either saved or unsaved. You're either spirit-filled or not spirit-filled. 
You're either obedient or disobedient. The Word of God will clarify every major life question. But the flesh says, well, you know, that's going to be hard. I'm going to have to give up pizza. I'm going to have to give up po' boys. I'm going to have to give up shrimp. I'm going to have to give up meat. I'm going to have to give up. Y'all are doing a Daniel fast. I've never done a Daniel fast because I don't have the ability to eat some and not eat others. So when I fast, I just don't eat. It's easier to go all in than half in. Just water. I did a 40-day fast one time. I felt the, And I, I don't recommend anybody do that unless the Spirit of God has spoken to you to do that. There's no, those are not common. And I can tell you, at the end of 40 days, I'd lost 37 pounds. And my energy level was, whew. But my hunger for God was at an all-time high. When you crucify the flesh and so do the Spirit, things happen in your life. And you just do that. The third thing is don't let the devil drive you off of it. Don't let the devil bring up your past. Don't let the devil condemn you. Don't let the devil point out everything you've ever done wrong or said wrong. Last night I used a word in front of Joanna that I shouldn't have used about a waiter in a restaurant. And she looked at me horrified and I thought, oops. I went home and I thought, oh, my God, what, what am I thinking? I'm a communicator by living, but, you know, you kind of get relaxed and you're hanging out. And, you know, the words that we used when I was growing up are not words we use anymore. Does that, you know what I'm saying? Doesn't mean they're not in there. Every racist term you've ever had, I used. And when, in the 60s and 70s, they weren't considered racist terms. Now, they weren't right. But looking back, you see they weren't right. In the presence as a six- or seven-year-old little boy, those were the words you used. How do we bridge that when the devil says, you said that, you did that, you thought that, you neglected that? Don't let the devil drive you out of God's blessings because of your humanity. All of God's treasure comes in earthen vessels. And we not only have to learn how to give other people grace, we have to learn how to give ourselves grace. So all I can say is, I'm sorry. Now what you do with that is up to you. Somebody said, I was at a funeral the other day, and this guy was there, and I stuck my hand out to shake his hand. He said, I'm not shaking your hand. And I said, what, well, are you going to keep lying about me all over town? Because he, he keeps telling people that I ruined his life. And the answer is he didn't do what I told him to do. And uh, he spent all his money on something that he thought was a ministry that I introduced him to. And I told him, I said, I'm going to introduce you to this. Don't spend your money on it. Let the ministry pay for itself. Well, he spent his life savings on a ministry I told him not to. And he's mad at me because I told him about the ministry. And I thought, and he's gone over town. You know, Mari Davis ruined my life. Mari Davis ruined my life. Mari Davis. And I thought, no, Mari Davis didn't ruin your life. You ruined your life because you didn't listen to Mari Davis. I told you because he wasn't familiar ministry. It, it was a, it was a, a benevolent ministry uh, that he was starting in a third world country to create homes for the elderly. We have, home, we have orphanages, but nobody takes care of the elderly in those countries. And he created a ministry, and I connected him to an organization. Well, the organization went bankrupt. They ran out of money to support ministry. I told him, don't spend your money. He's just, and he's just talking. I'm at a funeral, and he comes up to me. I, I, I said, and I just looked at him. We're sitting in front of a bunch of police officers that are all my friends. I said, how bitter are you going to be? You're going to die in bitterness. He said, well, I tell you what, I have a right to be bitter. I said, you may have a right to be bitter, but you don't have a reason to be bitter. And I said, if you keep lying about me, you're going to go to hell. He said, how dare you tell me I'm going to go to hell? I said, oh, that's my job. I said, now, I love you, and I'm your friend. Here's my cell number. You want to call me, I'll meet with you anytime and talk. But rather than you just talking about me, you ought to talk to me. And one of the police officers said, why don't you talk to him? I'm not talking to him. He said, well, then shut up. But you know what the devil wants you to do? I'm not going to go over and talk to those people because that guy's over there and it's going to be a scene. And so rather than maintaining your influence, you get driven out of a place of influence because you're avoiding confrontation. If you want to get to a place called best, you've got to believe it, you've got to see it, you've got to claim it, you've got to take it, you've got to buy it, and you've got to keep it. And if you do that, you'll never stop here in your personal life or in your church. So let me pray with you for just a moment.
Father, I pray for the people that are in this room. And God, I pray that people that need a change in their life, that they would find the area of this message that is appropriate and specific to their need. And they would take it and internalize it. They would let the word of God, the seed of the word, be planted in their heart. That God, they would grow in faith out of that seed. And out of that seed would produce fruit. Now your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Let me just ask for just a minute. How many say, Maury, in one of those areas of my life, I need prayer? Just raise your hand up. Just raise your hand. Okay, just stand up right where you are. If you, if you raise your hand, just stand up right where you are. And let me, let me see if we can do this. Let me see if the people around you that love the Lord could just come around you. If you're sitting and you're not standing, would you just come and put your hand on the shoulder of somebody that's standing? Let's, let's make sure we all have somebody praying with everybody. Somebody praying with everybody. Yeah. Yeah. 